This is the second in a series of messages called Can We Trust the Bible? I'll take questions after the uh, message. So if you want to ask anything about can we rely on the Bible or it's something I say today, uh, you can ask me then. Billy Graham in his autobiography, Just As I Am, tells about how as a young man going into the ministry, he struggled with whether we can rely on the Bible. His friend and partner in preaching, Chuck Templeton, enrolled in Princeton Theological Seminary, a Presbyterian seminary, and after one year, uh, Billy could see that he, Chuck was really struggling with the reliability of the Bible. He said to him, Billy, you're like 50 years out of date. Nobody believes the Bible's inspired like you do anymore. And it caused Billy to go through a whole question of, can we trust the Bible? I had a similar experience. My senior year in college, I decided to become a pastor. Felt like God wanted me to do that. I was going to become a Presbyterian pastor, and so I wanted a good uh, evangelical uh, school. So I enrolled at Trinity, which was the leading uh, cutting-edge evangelical seminary in the country at the time in Chicago. My friends, I had several friends who were also deciding to become pastors, and they enrolled in places like Harvard, Yale, and Vanderbilt, some of the most liberal seminaries in the country. And after a year, I talked with them, and like they didn't know what they believed anymore. M thousands of Christians have had their faith in a reliable Bible challenged in the last century. Why do so many people in our culture not believe the Bible is true? Let me review the four reasons I said last week. One, they begin with an anti-supernatural bias. They start with the assumption that we live in a naturalist world. All there is is what you can see and touch. So they take the Bible and they throw out all the miracles as inauthentic. Those can't happen. And then any prophecy that's made that's later fulfilled, they have to throw those out because those are supernatural in nature too. By the time they're done, we're, we're left with a Bible and with a Jesus who is stripped of his divine power and divinity. A second reason some people do not think the Bible is true is because they begin with, begin with the assumption that people of faith do not report history accurately. Uh, they exercise kind of a cultural imperialism uh, that, that believes that only in the last 200 years have we learned how to write history accurately. That the ancients just kind of made it up and called it history. Our text last week was Luke 1, 1 to 4. And we looked at Luke, the uh, ardent follower of Christ, yet he says how carefully he investigated everything so that he could give an accurate narrative of the life of Christ. Third reason many people do not believe the Bible is because there's an ignorance of the Bible. Never in the history of our country have so many people grown up never going to church or Sunday school. No religious instruction in their home. So when someone says, hey, the Bible's not true. It's filled with errors. They can't refute it. They can only shrug their shoulders. The fourth reason many people do not believe the Bible is true is because they don't want the Bible to be true so they can live however they want. Now, there are three primary ways people view the Bible today. For nearly 18 centuries, virtually everyone in the church held the orthodox position that the Bible is inspired by God and infallible. Many, like me, still hold this position. Although the Bible was written by human beings, we believe that the Holy Spirit intervened in such a way that the writers of Scripture wrote by the inspiration of God without error. Now, what do we do when someone uh, takes in a passage and says, oh, look, here's an error? Do we immediately jump to the conclusion that it's wrong? No, we work on it and see if we can find a solution. For example, Matthew 12, 40, Jesus says he's going to be crucified, buried, and, th and be in the grave three days and three nights. Critics said, aha, we know Jesus died on a Friday evening, and he was raised 6 a.m. on Sunday morning. That's only a day and a half. There's an error. But people began to study it, and they learned that in Hebrew, a day or a night, it refers to any part of of a day or night. So it is true. Jesus was in the grave Friday, 
Saturday and Sunday, three days and three nights. The second view of scripture started at the time of the French Revolution. Enlightenment thinkers began to teach that the Bible is a human document and fallible. It's no more inspired than any other book. It's written by humans. Obviously, humans make errors. There's mistakes in the Bible. Some things are true. Some things aren't true. We have to figure out which things are true. The problem with this view is that without an authoritative Bible, our foundation of our faith is removed because the Bible tells us just about everything we know about God and Christ. Think of uh, us worshiping today and while we're in here worshiping, construction workers are underneath removing the foundation. We assume everything's fine, not realizing our church is about to crumble. Once it became clear that this position led to theological bankruptcy, like my friends who decided their senior year to, to enroll in places like Yale and Harvard, another position became popular. Although the Bible is a human document, God still speaks through it. They claim that God's miracle is not preserving a reliable Bible, but that even though it's filled with errors, God still speaks through it. His miracle is speaking through it. Uh, those who hold this position get to have the best of both worlds, so to speak. They don't have to defend against those who criticize the, the Bible and say they find errors. They can still believe that God has a, the miracle of speaking through it. So they don't have to worry about uh, demonstrating that Christ really rose from the dead. It doesn't matter. We can still have the resurrection lift. The obviously shortcoming of this view is that if Christ did not rise from the dead, in what sense can we hope for a resurrection from the dead? And if the Bible's not true in some things, how can we know it's true in other things? Rosario Champagne Butterfield in her book, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, says to her new pastor who leads her to Christ, you have one book that says it's true, the Bible, I have 50 books in my library that say it's not true. So how can we decide if the Bible is true? I believe we can believe the Bible is true. I'd like to share with you over the next three weeks six reasons we can believe the Bible is fully reliable. First, there are the claims of the Bible. The Apostle Paul writes, all scripture is God-breathed. The Greek word theonoustos is a compound of theos, God, and noustos, breathed. The toss at the end of noustos makes it passive in meaning. This indicates that theonoustos means breathed out by God. The scripture had its origin in God, not in man. The creative breath of God himself gave us scripture. Moreover, pasagraphe, all scripture, refers to the written words, not just to the divine meaning. The claim is that the words of scripture are inspired or breathed out by God. God didn't just add his breath to human authors. He was the origin of the scriptures. Peter writes, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. He says, writers didn't make this stuff up. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. If you believe the scriptures are breathed out by God and they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, it follows axiomatically that you can believe that the Bible is trustworthy in every regard. Solomon writes, every word of God is flawless. Moses says, God is not man that he should lie. Since God never lies, all scripture is true. The Apostle Paul writes, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, Paul says, scripture says to Pharaoh. He then begins to quote what God said in Exodus 9.16, meaning that whatever scripture says is what God says. In Romans 9.25, we read, As God says in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people. He tells us that God speaks through the book of Hosea. In other words, what's written in the Bible 
is God's word. We read in Hebrews 3, 7, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He quotes Psalm 95, which is written by David. So he's saying that what David wrote in the Psalms is written by the Holy Spirit. We can believe the Bible is true. All ancient documents are public documents. We believe that they're true unless they prove themselves false. I don't find anything that proves itself false in the Bible, so I believe its claim that it says it's all God breathed. But since believing that the Bible is true because the Bible claims that it's true is circular reasoning, we need to look at the five other reasons. The second reason we can believe the Bible is true is because of the documentary evidence. Lee Strobel was a journalist for the Chicago Tribune. He called himself a document rat. He was constantly looking through court filings, looking for tidbits that had become news. And because he was so uh, faithful at doing that, he constantly scooped the competition with stories. His biggest find was finding a cache of documents from Ford Motor Company, uh, in their case uh, it, with uh, the Ford Pinto. Uh, three teenagers died in a fiery crash, and they sued Ford. And he found in these documents that Ford knew, they were warned that the Pinto was dangerous. If a, if a car struck it from behind at 20 miles an hour, it could blow up. But they ignored it so they could make a few more bucks, and they could have a little more luggage space in the trunk. As he was photocopying, as Strobel was photocopying these documents, a, uh, a, a lawyer for uh, Ford Motor Company walked through the court and he hurriedly came to the court to, uh, for an injunction to seal the documents from the public view, but it was too late. Strobel released his story headline, Ford Ignored Pinto Fire Peril, Secret Memo Show. It was bannered in the Chicago Tribune and then it was passed on to newspapers all across the country. Obtaining corporate documents is one thing, but how do you know they're true? He was looking at copies. It had the Ford Motor Company letterhead on it, but how could he know that what he was photocopying was actually the original? How did he know it hadn't been altered? Before a journalist can go with the story, the journalist has to know that the documents are reliable. It's the same issue we face with all uh, documents. How do we know that when we hold an, a New Testament or an Old Testament, I mean, what we read here in the New Testament, the original Manuscripts have long since crumbled into dust. How do we know that the copy we hold is the same as the original? Now, this isn't unique to the Bible. All ancient documents have to face the same test. What the New Testament has in its favor is the huge number of copies that have survived. The more surviving documents that you have, the better you can cross-check them and determine what the original document said. Some people say, how can we believe the Gospels? Jesus died in 33 AD. The Gospels aren't written until 50 to 80, 70 AD. How do we know they weren't changed? Let me put it in perspective. Compared to other ancient documents, the New Testament is without parallel. The Bible is without parallel. Plato, we hold seven uh, ancient documents. The earliest date is 900 AD. That means the time between when Plato wrote and the earliest manuscript we have is a gap of 1,200 years. Yet when you read Plato, you assume, don't you? You're reading Plato? Euripides, we have nine documents. The earliest document is 1,100 AD, so the gap between any wrote and what we have is 1,500 years. Aristotle, we have 49 ancient documents. The earliest is 1,100 AD. The gap between Aristotle and the earliest document is 1,400 years. Yet we assume when we read Aristotle, we're reading it, right? Homer's Iliad, we have 650 ancient documents. Earliest dated 200 AD. The gap is 1,000 years. 
Tacitus, we only have two ancient documents, dated the earliest 850 AD, a gap of 734 years. Josephus, we have nine ancient documents, the earliest dated 1000 AD, a gap of 900 years. The New Testament has 24,000 documents. The earliest are dated 100 AD, only 50 year gap between when they're written and what we have. We have 99 papyrus documents of various parts of the New Testament. Uh, those are written on papyrus plants. We have 306 uncials. Those are written on animal skins. The most fascinating one is Sinaiticus. It's the whole New Testament. And it's dated 350 AD. So about 300 year gap or maybe 275 year gap to when this was written. The other one is Vaticanus, also dated 350 AD. It's practically the entire New Testament. All total, we have 24,000 documents. Some are fragments, some are the whole New Testament. F.F. F. Bruce in New Testament documents, Are They Reliable? says, There is no body of ancient literature in the world which enjoys such a wealth of good textual attestation as the New Testament. We have lots of manuscripts. And many of them are close in time to when the New Testament was originally written. Let me tell you what we know. The apostle, uh, the, the Luke wrote the book of Acts. It's about the ministry of the Apostle Paul. There's nothing in the book about Paul's death. So we know that Luke had to be written by 62 A.D. The, sequ the, the, the previous book is the Gospel of Luke. That means Luke has to be written by 61 AD. Luke, we can tell from his writing, relies on the Gospel of Mark. So we believe Mark was written 59 AD. We don't know exactly when Jesus died, but assuming Jesus died in 33 AD, the time between Jesus' death and the Gospel of Mark being written is only 26 years. And Luke, it's only 28 years. Matthew, his theme is that Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfiller of Old Testament prophecies. Yet he shares nothing about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Since that's his theme, we have to believe Matthew was written in the 60s. It would be preposterous that he didn't uh, give the greatest prophecy of all time, the fall of Jerusalem. And we say the same thing about the Gospel of Luke. We believe it had to be written by 70 AD. Now, the most interesting text, and so the, the point of all that is there's only uh, between like 26 and 37 years between the death of Christ and the written Gospels, when there are many eyewitnesses walking around. I mean, Mary, when Mark was written, would have only been 73 years old. She certainly knew the life of Christ and saw his death and resurrection. And so eyewitnesses are walking around when these are written. And if, if what was written in the New Testament wasn't true, they could say, hey, it didn't happen that way. There are even hostile eyewitnesses that didn't believe in Christ. They can say, no, no, no. But we don't have any case of anybody writing that what happened in here is not true. The most fascinating text is 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. For what I received, this is the Apostle Paul. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. So this is a New Testament creed that was read around the church. So what we know about Paul, or if we assume Jesus died in 33 AD, in 35 AD, Paul, walking on the road to Damascus, met Christ and was converted. Then in 36 AD, he went to Jerusalem to meet with Peter and James and John and the New Testament apostles. And that's when he received this creed that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In other words, they were prophesied that he would die, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So in 36 AD, we already have a creed that Christ died and was raised from the dead. New Testament critics would want us to believe that nothing was written until like 80 or 90 or 100 AD after all the eyewitnesses had died. And they can say that Christ was raised from the dead and nobody can refute it. But now we have evidence that just three years later that was widely taught in the church that Christ died and was raised. Acts 
As for the Old Testament, things were going along pretty well for Old Testament critics that say, you know, these the miracles in here, they're not true. The prophecies in here that were fulfilled later, we know they're not true. They're written after the fact until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. A Bedouin boy in 1947 named Muhammad was looking for a lost goat and he threw a little rock in, the, uh, in a cave and he heard pottery. And so he went in to investigate and he found all these pots filled with scrolls that were wrapped in linens and fully covered in leather. They were so well preserved that when uh, scholars uh, studied them, they believed they had been there uh, from 68 AD, left there by the Essenes, until they were found in 1947. The most fascinating discovery in it was the Isaiah scroll. They found that the Isaiah scroll in there, dated 125 BC, was almost identical with the Masoretic text, which is the, the, the official Hebrew Bible dated 916 AD. And there was like practically no changes, any words whatsoever. So if we know that it was perfect, oh, and before the uh, printing press, the only way the scripture could be passed on was by scribes writing it line by line. So if over a thousand year period it was preserved almost exactly, we can pretty well guess that it was just as well preserved from 125 B.C. to 700 B.C. when Isaiah wrote. So what we have in the Bible, we can pretty much know is almost identical to the original manuscript. Does that make sense? Now, it changed uh, the way critics were viewing other Old Testament books. Uh, psalm 22 is a messianic psalm about the death of the Messiah and what Christ would go through at the crucifixion. But crucifixion was not introduced into the world until the Romans in Jesus' time. So how do they account for this being prophesied about in, in Psalm 22 years before? Well, critics would say, well, Psalm 22 was probably written after Christ's death. That's why he had all these prophecies. But then, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found the Psalms all there dated 125 B.C. And, and the Psalms written hundreds of years before Christ. So it had to be supernatural a prophecy. So the Bible is an excellent public document with superb documentary evidence. The writers claim to be eyewitnesses and we have little reason to doubt their work. We have good reason to believe the Bible is true. The story of the Keeper of the Spring is a parable for our time. The Keeper of the Spring was a forest dweller who lived high up in the Alps above a Swiss village. He would clear the, the creeks that went down into the village of branches and leaves and the silt that would clog them up and the little hamlet became a popular uh, vacation place. Well, at their semi-annual meeting, uh, the keeper of the purse said, why do we keep paying this guy? We never see him. For all we know, he's not doing anything. So they dispensed with his services. Well, nothing changed for a few weeks, but then fall came and the leaves began to fall and branches fell and began to clog up the, the creeks coming down into the town. And then kind of scum began to form on t top of the water, the ponds. Disease creeped into the city. The mill wheels slowed down until they stopped completely. The swans left and tourists left. Well, the board quickly got together. They realized their gross error in judgment and they hired back the keeper of the springs. Within a few weeks, things were flowing again freely and the life came back to the little town. It's not an idle tale. It's an analogy of what we're dealing with here and talking about the Bible. What the keeper of the springs meant to the village, defenders of the scripture mean to the church of Christ. If we want our faith to be pure and strong, we have to hold to what Jesus taught, that all the Bible is God-breathed, fully inspired by him. And in order to believe that, you must know the scriptures well enough and know enough about it that you can defend the Bible in the face of critics. Father, thank you for your word. 
where you show us so much about yourself and Christ and the Holy Spirit. And thank you that we've seen just a little bit that there's good evidence that we can believe the Bible is fully reliable. Speak to us as we go through this series and look at other reasons why we can believe the Bible. I want to give you a moment just to talk to God. Tell him you believe in the Bible if you do. If you're convinced that there are good reasons. And why don't you tell him if you believe the Bible's true, you're going to spend time in it this year. Just maybe 15 minutes a day. Reading the Bible and meditating on it. You pray. Thank you, God, for giving us, inspiring a word so that we can not only see you in nature, but we can know you from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.